This Week in Startups is brought to you by Clavio helps brands build relationships across any distance, delivering email marketing moments your customers will appreciate, remember, and share in good times and bad. Visit clavio.com slash twist today to start your free trial. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash twist. And Silicon Valley Bank, who, in partnership with Founders Pledge, has formed the COVID-19 Global Impact and Innovation Fund. This fund will deliver resources directly to organizations that can help make the most immediate impact in the fight against COVID-19. Learn more at svb.com slash impact. All right, everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups. It is, uh, what is it, May 20th, 21st, uh, when you're hearing this, uh, Thursday, May 21st. And we're going to do another news roundtable. We're in the middle of the pandemic, but things seem to be winding their way slowly, circuitously uh, here in the Bay Area to reopening. Who knows what that will look like? We'll talk about that as well, but we're going to cover the news because even during a pandemic, technology companies, media companies are extremely active. In fact, it feels like things are more active now than they've ever been. So business is continuing, and I'm really excited to have Zach Coleus back on the program. He's a managing partner at Coleus Capital. Uh, you can follow him on the Twitter, Zach Coleus, C-O-E-L-I-U-S, and uh, he invests in startups. Uh, we do it together sometimes, and he's just a world-class investor and human being. Welcome back to the program, Zach. Thank you. Uh, and with us uh, is Sam Parr from The Hustle. I spoke at his conference and uh, Hustle Con, I think it was called. And he has The Hustle newsletter and a new newsletter that's uh, about trends, which we'll talk about. Uh, and I, have you been on the podcast, Sam? No. No. Just, we've hung out. We've but, hung, uh, but you haven't been on we've yet. We've hung. Yeah. And I was like, huh. Uh, but you're you're very active on the Twitter. Yeah, I try to be. I you, think we have the same haters. Well, I think it's because we're both capitalists. And outspoken and sometimes obnoxious. Okay, well, there you have it, folks. <laughs> Welcome to the program, Sam Barr, your first appearance bringing the heat already. Let's get right into the news, huh? shall we? Um, there is a uh, podcast that is called Call Her Daddy. And it's, pu it's published by Barstool Sports. Uh, everybody knows Barstool Sports because... The guy who runs it, uh, Dave Portnoy, Portnoy, I think is how you pronounce his name, uh, is an outspoken, obnoxious jerk as well. Uh, he's in the club. So the three of us should hang out and do jerk club at some point, obnoxious club. Um, I know him because, well, you can't not know him because he's super controversial on Twitter, but I, I've seen him the last week or two day trading a $3 million position on CNBC and losing and winning a million dollars a time. He really knows how to get attention. Anyway, they have a hit show called, um, what is the name of the show again? Call Her Daddy. Call Her Daddy. I, now, I, they broke up. The two hosts are named Alexandra, Alex, and Sophia. And I guess it's a sex theme comedy podcast. Uh, I listened to the first 10 minutes. It's absolutely unlistenable. They have the two most annoying voices ever I've, I've heard in radio. But It's just like the man show, but for women. Perfect. Got it. So I got about 10 minutes into it and- I felt like my ears were bleeding, but I could understand the appeal, um, I guess, I think. Um, is Now, do you listen to this, Sam, this podcast? Are you a fan of the podcast, fan of Barstool? I'm a fan of Barstool. I know all about Barstool. I know I'm a fan of their business. I know a fair bit about them. I've listened to the podcast a little bit. Same. Look, I'm not the target demo, but I, I get it. It's interesting. So um, it's a really interesting story on a media basis, which Sam and I are both in the media business. They hired these uh, two very talented people who built a, a apparently a very um, successful podcast uh, with two million plus downloads per episode, um, and in the top twenty most popular podcasts on Apple at times. And both hosts made five hundred thousand dollars in twenty nineteen. However, they were making up to a hundred k in advertising per show, uh, which is about five million a year. So I guess they were taking in twenty percent of the ad revenue if they were sold out. But anyway, uh, if they weren't sold out, they're taking about a third, but they didn't take the risk on it. Obviously, Barstool owned all the IP. And then a huge tell-all was released on the Call Her Daddy feed, which I did listen to, which is hilarious because Dave Portney clearly does not give any fucks about anything. 
And he basically walks through the entire sordid tale of them trying to negotiate with them. And they came to him with this like ridiculous request to get paid a million dollars each to get 90% of the merchandise to get basically everything and to own the IP to which he told them to pound salt. And then I guess the punchline is uh, one of their one of the two host boyfriends was allegedly uh, trying to get them over to Wondery, which is a bit of a disaster of a podcasting app platform that was trying to build the HBO podcasting. And that didn't work. Uh, and long story short, one of the two of them is going to come back and screw the other one. And it's still up in the air, which then put the podcast as the number one podcast on iTunes. So a cynical person would say, D- Dave, just this is all a put on and they just had this breakdown in contract negotiations or to go to the top. But that doesn't seem like what's happening here. What, what do you, can, what's your can, take can on all can this? I even, yeah. Can I even simp- I'll even simplify it. Let's simplify this into a, in a, in three sentences, which is two. Uh, these two women start a podcast at Barstool Sports. Within 12 months, it shoots up to be one of the biggest bo- podcasts in the world. Uh, one of the women's boyfriend works at HBO. He tries to go in their ear and say, hey, you're getting screwed. You need to get out of this deal. Both of them try to renegotiate. They end up getting in a fight with Dave. They end up fighting with each other. And Dave is announcing to the world what's going on. Pretty much. That, it's a that's pretty what's good going recap. On right now. Um, I think, and then what's happening is the woman who's the woman and her boyfriend, uh, their name is uh, Sophia and Suitman. They're calling this guy Suitman. They are looking like fools right now in the media because Dave just calls them out and he posts their fit pictures and he says how stupid and greedy they are. And long story short, what's going to happen, I think, is uh, one of the women's going to come back and it's going to be a great deal. They're all going to they're all going to do well. Um, what's interesting is while all this is going on in the background pen gaming which is the, the company that owns barstool its stock crashed it, w- it was at thirty dollars it went down to six dollars a share now it's gone back up to twenty eight dollars thirty dollars or so oh. it's almost back to where it should be so dave is winning because he just won a million dollars in the in the markets the other day his, his they sold the company for six hundred million dollars in stock recently and that stock now is back to where it was and i think one of these women is going to come back and do the podcast so he's I having a, a he's had a terrible last week and an incredible this week, and he's super transparent and entertaining about it. It's uh, so fun. Now it's tell me so about fun. the company that bought Barstool because he's been doing Barstool for the better part of two decades, right? Like this is a very old company. It's seventeen around- years. It's seventeen years old. The company that bought it was called uh, Penn Gaming. When they uh, bought Barstool, they were about a three and a half billion dollar valuation. They basically are just our casinos, and they bought. Uh, Barstool because Barstool has a their fastest it's kind of like Justin TV and Twitch their fastest growing it, Barstool was sport only sports but they actually the fastest growing segment started small but it was sports betting now it's quite huge and once sports betting became legal Penn goes hey we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna you're gonna this is like our version of Disney Park so we're gonna have like the Penn Gaming Barstool sports book over here and then we're gonna have the Dave Portnoy pizza bar over here that type of thing ah so he's there uh, Star Wars or Marvel in this uh, equation, and they were going to literally put bar stool bar stools in casinos, and they were going to do all this online gambling. And so 100%. that's percent. That's really, I think, the meta story here is that online gambling combined with content could be a solution for the content industry. And I think NB- the NBA is getting into gambling as well. They want to have in arena wagering and all this kind of stuff. And Barstool was already making about $110 million a year in revenue. It in itself is a great business. But the day it bought Penn Bottom, their uh, Penn stock went up a billion dollars or so. I mean, wow. it popped big time. So a lot of people think this is a good deal. Um, it's super interesting. And the whole time, Dave is just... He doesn't hold back. He tells everyone what's going. He goes, I- "I'm broke now with the with Penn. This was three weeks ago or f- three months ago. I'm broke now with Penn stock going down in the gutter. Now I'm going to put three million in an account and and day trade because sports betting doesn't exist anymore." Wow! And then it comes right back. All right. Uh, any thoughts on this, Zach? <laughs> I started to drag you into this sordid mess that Sam and I are delighting in as media executives. Anything I'm to watching- take away from? I'm watching and laughing and loving it. It's beautiful. Keep it going. <laughs> Did you see uh, Donald Trump retweeted Portnoy yesterday? And Elon Musk said Portnoy should run for president or run for office. Yeah, he's definitely entertaining. He's got a Trump-like, uh, spastic, you know, unfiltered nature. He's a to loose him. cannon. It's a. It's a, you get to watch this guy have meltdowns and. 
it, it's just exciting. Look, this is like the, our version of Kim Kardashian. It was actually interesting. I, I think he came up in another episode where he said something about unions. And he's like, if you bring a union to Barstool Store, it's like, I'll fire everybody or whatever. He said like. And then, and then AOC hopped in. Yeah. What's her name? <laughs> uh, and Andrew- he, yeah. yeah, he goes, I'm going to crush you. Like, he, he goes, if anyone talks to that lawyer, I'm firing you. Which is like literally the rule number one of unions organizing is people have the right in America to labor has the right to organize. You can't fire them for organizing. Yeah, but and he, he literally this, tweets that he has this Alex Jones umbrella, which is like it's all entertainment. And in Portnoy's case, it truly is entertainment. And I think people understand that. Yeah, but except gets, when you get pulled in front of a lawyer and you get in trouble for, you know, uh, actually having to explain that right and you get kicked well off he's every gone platform. to jail two different times for their their skits one time he broke into the nfl uh like a game and they locked him up and he spent a couple of days in jail another time he um broke into uh the super bowl and they arrested him so this guy's crazy and oh right i heard about the super bowl thing he he went in a disguise but they found him right yeah, and then interestingly, Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL, basically has banned all barstool employees from the game. Well, the other day, Roger Goodell auctioned off a chance to watch the football game in his man cave at his house, and Dave won the bid, and so he spent a quarter million dollars, and so now he's going to be spending uh, the evening with this guy who hates him, and so it's wonderful. That's nice to see somebody out there uh, just trolling. Yes. Uh, but yeah, no, the, you cannot use the parody to get out of everything. Like if you actually slander somebody or actually commit a crime, you, you don't get to say parody. Like you don't get to murder somebody or steal their car and say parody <laughs> that a judge will still put you in jail and you'll still hey, be that's, liable. That's he, he's paying the toll for my, uh, my laughter. All right. When we get back from this quick break, uh, we'll throw it to Zach and talk about SoftBank's ginormous $17 billion annual loss when we get back on this week's earth. In uncertain times, supporting your community and growing relationships with your customers is a strategy that will be appreciated, remembered, and it'll be shared. In good times and bad, open and empathetic communication with your customers is key. It's critical. Email is and has always been one of the best channels for delivering these communications. We all know that. And email marketing is one of Klaviyo's core offerings. And when you leverage personalization driven by a 360-degree view of the customer, those emails will feel even more relevant, fostering a deeper and stronger relationship. Klaviyo truly understands how challenging it is for each and every entrepreneur to get their business off the ground, let alone navigate such trying times. If you're feeling overwhelmed with growing your business, especially in this climate, you're not alone. Klaviyo is here to help brands build relationships across any distance. So here's your call to action. Create meaningful, memorable email marketing moments that last a lifetime. Visit klaviyo.com slash twist to start a free trial. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, welcome back to This Week and Dave Portnoy. Um, I kid. Uh, moving on to uh, additional business news. SoftBank reported a $17.7 billion annual loss overall. Worst figures in its 39-year history. Uh, the $100 million vision fund went from the group's main contributor of profit a year ago to its biggest drag on earnings. The situation is, is exceedingly difficult. Our unicorns have fallen into the sudden coronavirus ravine, but some of them will use this crisis to grow wings. Masayoshi San, um, a number of people referenced my Pegasus blog post uh, for this one. And it, there was actually a slide in the deck, which we'll pull up on the screen in a moment if we can find it, with literally unicorns in a ditch going up a hill and then one <laughs> of them flying over the chasm. Uh, Uber share price was responsible for $5 billion of the Vision Fund's losses. If you don't know, they bought privately at a, a price that is slightly higher than uh, Uber is trading at now. And WeWork, of course, um, contributed $4.6 billion in those losses. WeWork is now valued at $2.9 billion, which is down over 90% from a peak that clearly it never actually achieved. SoftBank has invested more than $18 billion in it and owns most of the company. That is WeWork. Um Masayoshi-san says he regrets investing and we were calling the move foolish, which actually I didn't know. And another $7.5 billion losses came to the rest of the portfolio. Um, and SoftBank is finalizing a deal to sell $20 billion in T-Mobile um, to raise capital. So, uh, Zach, what are your thoughts on the whole 
Masi, oh, there it is, the Valley of Coronavirus. In What's a little ridiculous about this is uh, the issues for WeWork have nothing to do or had nothing to do with coronavirus. And I would I would argue that the issues that WeWork have, has had were greater prior to coronavirus virus than after. And that's saying something. Zach, what's your take on this whole, um, let's call it 30 month experiment in the vision fund here in Silicon Valley? What's your what's your take on it? How will we look back on it? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of very cynical takes to be had. Easy to be um, cynical, yeah. It, you know, it's, it's easy to look at what happened and point a lot of fingers. But I think the lesson that I really sort of take away from this is that in startups, focus is everything. And especially when you have sort of a growth stage company where they've spent the majority of their time and attention, there's a really, it's really easy for executives inside the company to empire build and to run off and try to do new things outside of the core focus area of the business. And by shoving way more capital into these businesses than the businesses needed and wanted and expecting them to grow at faster rates than they were growing at the point that SoftBank invested, I think they really created a strategic imperative for these businesses to you know, expand focus and to enable executives to basically take that capital and run around and do crazy shit. And I mean, I think it's pretty clear systematically across all of their investments that that's a really, really bad strategy. And so, you know, for me anyway, I look at that as a reminder of like, okay, great. We saw what happens if you try to go off, you know, from where your core is, keep it focused. Like if, and, um, yeah, I mean, poker analogy see... comes to mind here. You know, you, you you win a couple of pots, big pots, and then you start playing every hand. Every hand. And you're playing out of position. And suddenly you're thinking like, yeah, my my 5-8 offsuit, this could be the one. Like, yeah, I'll play this under the gun. And then you start realizing like, well, why am I playing that hand? Do I have to play that hand or can I have a sip of coffee and check my yeah. SMS messages for a moment and not play, you know, 2-7 off and 10-5 because <laughs> it's not going to work out. It just placed way too many bets and too many big ones. But if yeah, but it's, it's, rebounds, I think it's more than I think it's more than just the bets, right? Yeah. I think if like if you look at Uber pre um, Masa and post Masa, if you look at WeWork pre and post Masa, if you look at almost every business in a pre post SoftBank involvement, you had pre Masa Uber was super focused. I yeah. mean, they were growing like crazy, but they were really, really focused on getting done what they needed to get done. And Masa went in there and said, here's endless money. Do whatever you want. And by the way, I want you to do everything. And lo and behold, Uber went from super focused to super unfocused. And the consequences were pretty calamitous. Yeah. But I don't I don't think that that's like a, a, a thing about the strategy. Because if yeah. you look at Masa Sons, if you look at his history, like have you if you ever study SoftBank, like this is what they did. They were not focused ever, and it but it, it worked wonderfully. No, no, yeah, Sorry. but we're talking about the. I think Zach you're, is talking about the impact on the founders to receive such this, a large amount of money. Yes, so yes, yes. The, I don't think I don't think it's SoftBank's being picking. unfocused because Moss has always been unfocused, right? Like he's all over the place. But I think that the way that in order for him to enter into this point in the market and to compete with the existing growth investors. Because of the nature of this market, he had to come in with more capital at higher prices. And when he did that, he drove up the expectations on those businesses and gave them a lot of capital to, to deploy. And so they had to move off of their organic growth rates that they were on with whatever their current focus was and expand their endeavors. And they, had, they all did it across the portfolio. All those businesses expanded their focus. And we all know what happens when you expand focus. Shit. It all breaks down. Yeah, if you're working on 10 things, it's not as good as working on two. I mean, it's it's pretty obvious things are going to go better. Um, yeah, I, I, I knew something was up when I had Tina Sharkey on the podcast and Brandless, which I thought was a brilliant idea. Um, kind of like the Uniqlo of like delivered foods. And I was like, this is an idea that'll work. I could see myself getting into this, putting stuff on subscribe and save. You know, who cares what the box says? Just get me the thing that you, I trust that I know is made to the highest standard for my family and, and I'll just buy it from you forever. And they, they raised 200 million. And I think they got it in two tranches of 100 million and eventually came out. But I just thought, that's, a, that's an ungodly amount of money. How does anybody stay focused? And how do you look at an employee who says, I would like to have my salary doubled and say no, right? Like, you, you just can't have no frugality. Yeah, can, you think... ra can you raise these rounds and just not tell anyone? 
because uh, I no. mean, I've got a, f- a, f- a few friends who have raised like 30 million and they're able to kind of keep it under wraps. That seems like actually the best strategy is to take this $200 million from SoftBank and just not say a word. Yeah, it's very hard to keep it quiet um, and, unless it's an inside round. Uh, and SoftBank's idea was we're going to pick the winners, anoint them, and be very public about the amount of money and that capital is an advantage. And we had Jeff on the podcast. That was their idea. Capital is an advantage. So we'll give you so much capital that other people won't even come into the market. Other people won't even try to compete, right? That was their idea. Um, and of course, it's not working very well at this point. I mean, I think I think you can basically say at this point, systematically, it's failed. And the, the, there's a lot of different arguments for why. But I, I think focus for me, it was the one I, I really point to. Because if you look at Google or Facebook, I mean especially in the early days, both of those businesses were just incredibly focused. I mean, you think about Chrome. Chrome seemed like such an obvious thing for Google to build, but they didn't build it for years and years and years and years because Eric was saying, no, 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 stick to the knitting, stick to the knitting. And they waited until they were really established before they started branching out and doing lots of other stuff. And other bets for for Google has been money losing net. And they mm-hmm. really, the growth has come from them buying things that were, uh, had great product market fit uh, and being fearless about buying it. They bought YouTube um, and they bought uh, Android, mm-hmm. right? So Google Analytics. Google Analytics. Yeah, I mean, there was a handful. And then if you look at Facebook, it's the same story, right? They just were bold about acquisitions. Apple, not bold about acquisitions. Amazon, bold about acquisitions. Whole Foods. Um, yeah. All right, let's move on to TikTok. I thought this was kind of interesting. I don't understand why we allow TikTok to be in this country as a Chinese company when, in fact, uh, our social networks are not allowed there. I don't know how anybody considers this not spyware by the Chinese government. However, uh, an incredible wrinkle just happened. ByteDance is now trading at $140 billion, and they've poached Disney's former head of streaming as the new CEO of TikTok, Kevin Mayer. Uh, was runner-up to replace Bob Iger, uh, and he lost out to uh, Bob Chapek, if I'm pronouncing correctly. Um, He made himself for a name, uh, uh, Kevin, that is, uh, made a name for himself as the head of Disney's direct-to-consumer group and oversaw the launch of Disney+, Plus, which is extraordinary. Um, He also played um, a role in all the acquisitions from Lucasfilm to Pixar to Marvel in, in 21st century. And I guess the question here is, um, I guess, did Disney drop the ball on promoting him? Or uh, what do you guys think about top U.S. executives running Chinese startups or at-scale companies? Can, can we even first talk about uh, ByteDance? And the, is it ByteDance or BitDance? ByteDance. Uh, it's B-Y-T-E, it. and that I'd would be a bite it. in typical parlance, yeah. Well, so whenever I – so I've read a, a fair bit about this company. It, how the hell did these companies get so big so fast like this? this so, like, like – because uh, this was – I believe TikTok is just one of their, like, side pro- products, no? Or it started – they, they, it, mit- they bought it from somebody and then rebranded it. Musically? Uh, musically, Yeah. So yeah, I don't know, and I, I'm assuming this trades in China, and I don't know how the valuations work in China of these companies. I mean, they could have a giant stock bubble over there as well, and well, I, it, I don't trust any of the numbers in, coming out of no, China. No, it makes billions in revenue. Yeah. I know they spent hundreds of millions of dollars two years ago or a year ago on marketing the United States. I don't know if you remember Facebook and other people, you would see TikTok ads everywhere, and I, and I, don't, I, I don't know the how wise it was to let them do that, but- let me just say this. Do you guys think that America should let Chinese companies infect every American's phones and track them everywhere they go and have access to their cameras and microphones? Does this not concern anybody but me? I, I still struggle with that concern from a from a sort of like national security perspective because I'm not really sure what data that they're going to be able to collect as a result of that. Um, I'm more sensitive and uh, I agree with you that not allowing U.S. companies to operate on an equal playing field in China, but basically Chinese software companies operating with carte blanche in the United States is pretty problematic. And I think it's another indication of the failure of you know, the U.S. government to, to enforce trade laws effectively. Um, 
there's the Chinese have gotten away with a lot for a long time now. And um, we need to they need to we need to even that playing field. Yeah. And I don't think that's even a Trump position. I think um, even uh, Bernie Sanders had a pretty hawkish position on this relationship. And I, I don't understand what American would want to work for a Chinese company. You know, this Kevin Mayer is going to wind up being in a situation where he's going to have to turn over um, people for having an opinion in China who will then be tortured and put in jail. And so for Kevin Mayer, uh, what are you thinking? Why would you go work for a communist country and a communist company? I, well, what do you think? Money? Yeah. Opportunity. I mean, yeah. He's but definitely I mean, the CEO of one of the most powerful. It's like being the CEO of Snapchat at the moment. I mean, they're similar, uh, similarly sized uh it, it makes perfect sense why he would want to do that. But I actually think that young people are, are have incredibly high bullshit detectors and they know that this is a Chinese company. And I think it does make a lot of them nervous. And that's the only reason why they hired this guy, not for the content. So then what Kevin Mayer is doing is then he is giving cover for a Chinese company. And that's something I would not sleep well at night knowing. I would, If I was him, I would really think this through. I think it's a terrible career choice, to be totally honest. Why would you want to be subservient to the Chinese government in, in this regard, right? It's, it makes no sense. And if you, if, you, if you don't believe me, just look at what happened to Yahoo. Yahoo executives were put in an impossible position of having to have their employees go to jail and be banned from going to China uh, because they had to turn over dissidents. They had to turn over people for religious beliefs. You're basically buying into communism if you go work for a communist, a company that is headquartered in a communist country. That's what Kevin Mayer is doing. Kevin Mayer is now a communist, as far as I'm concerned. He's supporting a <laughs> communist company. I mean, I don't know. I know that's funny for everybody to think about, but I would, I would feel the same way about somebody who went to work, you know, for the Saudis and worked in a Saudi company that was, you know, anti-gay or anti-women or anti-human rights. Right? That's what we're talking about here. You're, you're talking about going over to for money to go sell out for money which you can make here just as easily, just like the NBA selling out by, you know, um, you know, throwing Daryl Morey under the bus for supporting Hong Kong. Like, where is the morals of the American business person when in relation to China, which is a very dangerous adversary for us to have and which tortures and imprisons people in the millions? Do, do you let your children use TikTok? No, I would never. No, I, I'm going to try to keep them off social media for as long as possible, number one, because it leads to depression. It leads to anxiety. Um, so I want to keep them off of that as long as possible. And I would never let them on these social networks because I think they're going to be targeted, right? I think there's a lot of like bad psychological impacts and I think you could be targeted by predators and other stuff like that. Do you use it, Zach? Uh, no, I don't. I don't use TikTok. Um, but I have a lot of friends who do. I mean, it's a it's actually a very well done product and their recommendation algorithms are probably at this point, the best in the world, as far as I can tell. So one of the things that's really interesting about the way their algorithm seems to work is it seems to be able to personalize the content to you as the individual within a very short interaction period mm. and to have a, it has a very tight feedback loop, which from what I understand technically is very difficult to pull off. Um, back to your earlier question about why they got as big as they did as fast as they did. Like they really have innovated in, and built some pretty amazing stuff over there. Yeah, I mean, the, it's an it is amazing. I, I use TikTok. It's 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 shockingly addicting. It's just amazing how these Chinese companies grow so fast. It I just um, the dot com bubble in America was something uh, interesting. But I've read a lot. Uh, I like to read a lot about the Chinese companies around that era, and they were even more epic. They they it got bigger faster and crumbled faster and it's well you so have a billion people right and you have no accountability fraud could be rampant and you would never know right so you know the the, the corruption over there you know as as much as you could look at situations like Veranos here or accounting fraud or whatever um, you know over there they the government literally picks the winners um, and you know the 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 monetary system is uh, managed and. Who knows what's reality? That's why people ask me, like, what's your favorite Chinese stock? I'm like, I would never play in a rigged casino. Like, that's like going to a home game run by a bunch of, like, mafia guys. Like, you, you don't know what you're up against. The deck could be marked. The other seven players in the game could be playing from one chip stack. So it's seven versus one. Like, this is a really bad idea. I mean, look at Luck and Coffee. They were claiming they had, what, twice as many 
<laughs> how much twice as much coffee being sold and that thing became one of the fastest growing unicorns there ever i would assume that most of the unicorns over there or a significant number of them uh are involved in some amount of what happened at luckin yeah i still there is definitely this like sense of admiration though i had from it's to me it's like it's like a love hate thing you know like i i disagree with a lot of the, what these guys stand for but it's almost like being a boxer it's like i i fear them and i want to crush them but i respect them and I'm incredibly fascinated with uh, a lot of these Chinese entrepreneurs, Japanese, uh, uh, like Masa Sun as well. Yeah, they they really do want to dominate the world and build very large companies in China. Like that is the goal. Like, and they have this giant market. You think about the size of the market there is just you're know, having over a billion consumers and having four or five consumers for every one we have. Even though our consumers spend more money in aggregate, they have a lot of consumers. Uh, any further thoughts on that, Zach? All right, when we get back from this quick break, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Facebook launching shops on Facebook and Instagram and partnering with Shopify and others, uh, and if this will be a giant boost for the ad-driven business to get in on e-commerce when we get back on this week's service. As we navigate unprecedented times, Silicon Valley Bank believes that collective action is the best way to overcome the challenges we're all up against. This is why Silicon Valley Bank, in partnership with Founders Pledge, has formed the COVID-19 Global Impact and Innovation Fund. This fund will deliver resources directly to organizations around the world that can help make the most immediate impact in the fight against COVID-19. Silicon Valley Bank has made an initial $1 million investment to fund this critical work and invites you to join them in helping those in need. Silicon Valley Bank continues to offer solutions that support small businesses and the innovation economy. For more than 35 years, Silicon Valley Bank has supported countless innovators with a passion for solving the world's biggest problems and today remains committed to helping its clients and employees and our communities manage through these uncertain times. To learn more about the Silicon Valley Bank COVID-19 Global Impact and Innovation Fund, visit svb.com impact. All right. Uh, welcome back to This Week in Startups. Zach Colius is with us and Sam Parr from uh, The Hustle. And what's your what's the name of your trend newsletter that's doing incredibly well? Trends.co. Trends. Trends. We just call it Trends. Trends.co is the URL. Beautiful. Uh, and that is a place to find the next big opportunity, the next big trend before it happens. Yeah. So we have a team of analysts and researchers and we go out and uh, we do research on interesting opportunities as well as case studies on cool companies. Very smart idea. It's what, two or three hundred bucks a year? Uh, 300 prices are going to go to 500 in June. All right. So get in there now while you can. Uh, Facebook is launching shops on Facebook and Instagram and partnering with Shopify and others. User are now, users are now able to browse and buy products directly from a business's Facebook page or Instagram profile. Around, around 1 million businesses have already signed up. Facebook's VP of ads, Dan Levy, said... While Facebook will charge small fees on each purchase, haha, the real monetization will come from driving more advertising. Shops can advertise on stories as well. Facebook is partnering with Shopify, Big Commerce, Woo, and others. Instagram shop to launch in uh, this this summer, and it will allow users to browse products directly from Instagram. So, Zach, what do you think? Uh, did Zuck do it again, or will this be a fail? Is this going to be a big one, or is it going to be modest? Will you buy stuff from Instagram? So I have a scar from one side of my belly to the other from where Zuck and his band of loyal men gutted me in my business in 2014. So I'm... Um, uh, you don't trust him? Well... You go to I bed mean, with Zuck, you wake up with your throat slit. That's basically <laughs> what you're saying. Well, yeah, I mean... I don't think you're not the only person who feels that way. No, 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 no. I, I'm trying to find the right metaphor because I don't think he slits your throat. It's more of like he welcomes you into your his home and he feeds you at his sumptuous table where food just comes in beautiful, amazing quantities. And you feel like a king and you are truly crushing the world. And then you look over and there's there's a very poor replica of you sitting right next to you. That's that not fat and fit and trim. like you, but not quite. And it's kind of badly built. And then you realize oh, I'm fucked. <laughs> I've been cloned. He been clones cloned. you and then he, del and he just deletes you. Well, basically. no, they didn't delete us. That was the best part was we, we saw it coming. We saw our clone. I was at a, a party and I met this Facebook engineer there and I was like, oh, what do you work on? He's like, oh, we built this um, 
dynamic creative engine, which is what our business did. Um, and he told me all about it. And I was like, oh, so they copied us. Okay. And then, and then like shortly thereafter, one of their PMs was like, hey, so we're going to build this thing that's a complete copy of you. Um, and you can now use these really shitty APIs to do what you did better with your technology. What do you think about that great idea? And I was like, oh, we're screwed. And then they just... <laughs> slowly dialed the traffic back. So even though our business was growing really fast because the customers loved what we were doing, we just saw our traffic slowly dying. Yep. And they went to all of our customers and they were like, hey, you can keep working with our old great partner, Trigit, or you can come work with us and get better. So, In this analogy, it- would it be Shopify, BigCommerce, and Woo that are making this mistake and that yes. eventually Facebook will just build a competitive version of Shopify and kill them? Exactly. At some point, basically, Facebook will... Like the, the cool thing about Facebook is, is that the thing that Zuck's done in sort of an organizational perspective, it's super smart, is that the, the PMs over there and their teams are largely little independent sort of city states. And they're all kind of feuding for power and control and sort of just generally achievement within the Facebook org. And so every single one of those city states has an incentive to go find something to do. And so they'll look at, well, all those folks will look at the Shopify and be like, hmm. I'm going to go copy that. And you can be assured that those projects are in the works as we speak. How did their story end? Oh, I died. Like they killed us we were, for about a year. We were gutted. So my guts were hanging out. I mean, we had a pretty big business and you we bled to death. A lot of you bled out with your, with your innards on your knees. Yeah. Slow, steady, sort of like, yeah, I've been there. When you get gutted, you don't die immediately. It took us about a year yeah. and then, and then, mm. You bleed out. Put out of our misery. Yeah, bleed out. It's, it would be easier if they just put the bullet in your head, but instead... Oh, my just... God, that would have been so much better. No, no, they it just would've... like to slice you open and then talk to you as your guts are falling on your knees. My favorite was they would lie to my face. It was so excruciating. They'd be like, totally. oh, no, we're not, we're not lowering your traffic. I was like, guys, I have Exactly what Matt Cutts from Google told me. We know exactly this what's going lie. on. Never trust like... Google or Facebook. Never. Oh, yeah. As if you're if you're in competition with them, assume this is why I tell my the founders I invest in. I just say do not meet with them, never meet with them. And then at some point, Y Combinator had made Facebook a partner, and they got to get mentorship. And I said anybody who lets Facebook into their accelerators lost their mind. And Paul Graham got a little upset at me, but he knew I was right. And then they wound up kicking them out eventually because, in fact, that's what Facebook was doing. They just look at startups, they wait till you hit scale. They partner with you, and then all of a sudden, instead of a hug, you realize, well, I am with an anaconda right now that is squeezing the breath out of me, and there's no way to get out of this grip. But you literally went to the anaconda's house. Don't go to how the anaconda's often, house. How often do you think that works versus when it fails? Because it, it, there's definitely examples of when it fails, but we don't know of all of them. Yeah. I think it's. I think the key is is that you have to basically delineate what's strategic for Facebook and what is ancillary because they they they're very focused as an organization like hyper 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 focused and so unless it really is strategic and it can drive it can move the needle in a material way for their business there you you're you're relatively safe in their home like they'll they'll kind of let you sort of like be a little peon running around in the corner but if we were in the ads business and you know we we basically showed them how to build the engine that they have now now it's amazing but when we started working with them they had no idea what they were doing and we were like look guys if you do this it will work and they did it it worked yeah but um yeah if you're strategic they will kill you what was their business thing didn't they have facebook for business that was going to kill slack and yammer that was the one yeah but facebook that's not for strategic. business it's Workplace. not strategic Workplace. Yeah. yeah, what happened to that? It's still around. Yeah. Well, they built it internally for their mm. own use. It works pretty well, but it's not strategic for them. Uh, I get pitched on that shit all the time. People, they're always reaching out to me. They're definitely selling it. Yeah. They're trying to sell. But who the are thing- they competing with? Are they coming up against Slack? They're saying take Slack yeah. out and put Facebook for business in? Yeah. And to be honest, it's pretty legit. Like, it's a great product. For Facebook's awesome. Like, the groups are the best right now. Facebook groups are the best communities on the internet. Um, now the, the pro the only problem is, is that people don't want to use Facebook because they, you know, this whole, uh, Zuck's evil thing, like normal people think that. So it's like this Facebook portal, the Facebook portal is fucking awesome, but people don't use that. Yeah. I would never they... let that in my house. So you, you have one. Yeah. But it, I have one right here sitting next to me because it's, it's a great way to talk to my mom. Hi, it's Zuck. awesome. Hi Zuck. Yeah. Look, he, yeah. Like, yeah. let's, let's say that he's listening to me. I'm not going to deny that it's an awesome product. All their shit's awesome. A lot of their yeah. stuff's awesome. But yeah, it is. You get. You, it is. Uh, I mean, talk know. about not being able to read the room. Can you imagine your Zuckerberg, and you just gave the entire democracy 
to Putin and Trump. And you're like, got all this like um, Cambridge Analytica, all these lawsuits and craziness. And you're like, hey, we'd like to have the Muppets sell you a camera for your home. And we want it to be always on. It's like, read the room, dude. Like, you're the last person anybody wants to hear from but, on this subject. But the thing is, that's not how their organization works. Huh. So it's not it's not Zuck basically like masterminding everything. Hmm. It's a team of really talented PMs who are very independent huh. and who are allowed to run with ideas, who basically build things and do things. And that I'm sure was something that basically just came out relatively organically to get you know to get the kind of traction it is. I mean the product is amazing. I mean it's a let really- me ask you a question, Zach. Yeah. If these people are so supremely talented running these these PMs and these groups and these five teams. Why on earth would they waste their lives working for Zuck stealing other people's ideas? That's what I always don't understand. Why not, in a market full of free money, say, you know what? F Zuck. I'm not going to steal Shopify. That's low. I'm not going to steal. I don't want to come to work and have Zuck tell me, steal Evan Spiegel's ideas. I don't want to steal Toby's ideas. I don't want to steal, you know, Zach's ideas. I want to come up with my own ideas. I want to pursue my vision and I'm just going to go down the street to Sequoia or Excel or Craft and I'm just going to get $3 million and start my journey or 10 million bucks and start my journey making my own thing. Why do they yeah, do a, it? I mean, you you and I have a, you know, an age old debate on whether or not Facebook is evil or if it's, you know, different. Um, I think it's different. I don't necessarily think it's evil, even with my scar. Do you think it's behavior is so, evil? How it um, operates is evil? No, I don't necessarily think that that's it's evil in its the way you think it is. Okay. Um, and so we, you know, it's a debate. We'll have it almost every time. I'm well, what sure would you describe talking. it as? Cla- classless or low <laughs> or sharp elbowed? How would you describe stealing Evan Spiegel's really, every he's idea? He's really putting you in this corner. No, no, it's on that corner. I want him to describe it in his words. How would you describe would you say stealing it's bad every... or horrible? <laughs> no, 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 no. Pick, pick. Is it cutthroat? I mean, you pick the word of what you think, think it is. How do you I describe think... it? I think Zuck plays on the playing field that I recognize as the real playing field, which is that he's a realist and he recognizes that power and the achievement of like real things is a zero sum game. And as long as it's not like explicitly illegal. um, And I think as long as it's like considered to be in the fair in the way that we think of Wall Street acting fair, which mm. is like, I can kill my opponent, I can trick my opponent, I, as long as I can legally steal from them, I will. Like, I think I think the Facebook team... So all is fair in and love and war. They just cut through. Oh, yes. And mm-hmm. so, like, if you look at, like, Microsoft with Embrace, Extend, Extinguish, if you look at the way that Google played in their ad business around, you know, really exercising their monopoly powers, if you look at any of these big, successful winning companies, I think they all played by that real politique sort of like Apple does part of war game against each other. You think Apple does? I mean, it seems like an outlier. Amazon does. I think absolutely. Apple does. They don't, they don't play it in the same way, Mm. but I think Apple absolutely does. Wait, so what are you angry about Jason? You're angry that Facebook copies people. I think the way they do it, where they relentlessly target a company for extermination and just copy every single feature like they did with Evan Spiegel, I thought was just so abhorrent. Um, And, and, all, and have other problems with their behavior and how they handle users and data and defaults, but I'll put that on the side. But I thought stealing ephemeral messaging, stories, and doing it pixel by pixel was a level of unnecessary theft that I thought could have been actionable, and I wish Snapchat had sued them for stealing the stories format. I felt it was just so abhorrent to steal it that blatantly that it feels classless, it feels unnecessary, um, and it's it was it was an obsession beyond... Um, it was an obsession beyond reasonable for them to be like, hey, you wouldn't sell us a company. Now we're just going to release. He had four versions, I think, of Snapchat before he actually got the Instagram folks to make it work. Um, and so I just, I feel like it's classless. I feel like they don't have class. I feel like it's it's stealing and it's unethical. Now, if he said, we have a better idea for stories, here it is. We're going to evolve it. But that's not what they do. I mean, to Zach's point, they literally just copy it and they make a a bad facsimile that eventually hit scale and it's it removes the other competitor. That, that's just my feeling on it. And I, I feel like Silicon Valley was slightly different before Zuckerberg and Facebook kind of uh, took this approach. 
You know, Microsoft had it a little bit, but there was almost like um, uh, a, a certain moral or ethical um, approach in, before Facebook when I was in the industry that if you did something that was just a direct copy, you were kind of a scumbag and you would be I, an outcast. It, Microsoft was the evil, evil empire that right. we all hated. And they, was, right. they were the worst. Absolutely. I mean, like, you could say that Microsoft Explorer relative to Netscape wasn't even a bad copy. It I, was I, I put both POS, companies in the, like, yeah. and they kill the better piece of software. I put both, like, companies, I put both companies in the same bucket. For but that how's this any di- I, I'm not even saying if I'm pro or against this, but how's this any different than Uber and Lyft? Um, yeah, I mean, there were three or four people who came out all in the same year. Um, one of them was doing Lincoln Town Cars. One of them was doing pay your own price, like tipping, sidecar. Uh, Zim Rides was doing ride sharing in the classic sense. And yeah, I mean, there were, it's okay if four or five people, like there were five or six net, social networking companies that all came onto the scene at the same time. And they all had kind of a different spin. MySpace let you be super creative. LinkedIn was only for business and Facebook was kind of like the amalgamation of two of those ideas, um, you know, like the structure of LinkedIn, but with a, uh, but for individuals. And so I, I kind of feel like that's different when the industry's nascent five or six people are in a dogfight to iterate. What I don't like is when somebody hits scale that they just wipe out the competitive set by copying them, so which is slightly different. If so that makes Zach, sense. So you Zach, you, you, you're not angry at them for copying you? You just chalk it up to the game? Yeah, no, I... I knew the, the the dance I was I was doing, and I knew I was dancing with a, the a formidable, deadly partner. And I thought I was going to be agile enough to basically, you know, hop out of the way with all those customers that they gave me and iterate on to the next thing. What I didn't realize is that when you start mainlining the Facebook crank, you're 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 there's no way to get off of it. Like. It's a dangerous, dangerous stance. I didn't understand it at the time. I was a baby entrepreneur. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I, I we we dabbled in Facebook groups, and it's really a great product. But then I was like, you know what? Screw this. Um, let's just set up a Slack instance for this week in startups, and we'll invite everybody there because we can control it. And Slack's business is not in owning our data. It's not in owning our users. It's just in software. And so I really feel I a, a journalist contacted me. I won't say which major publication, but they said well, they're doing a story about like the future of social networks. And I was like, I think the future is that people are getting frustrated with the public square because it's too toxic and um, they're going to make micro communities. It's going to kind of go back to smaller communities in Slack rooms or Discord rooms. And you kind of see like this whole little world pop up and it's really nice. Um, Clubhouse is like that. Which is? Clubhouse is Clubhouse is exactly like that, which is an interesting, uh, you know, piece of this, which is, I I don't know if I'd call them semi-private. Are you on uh, Clubhouse, Sam? Yeah, I was on. I've listened to you talk there. Oh, right, right. I did see you there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and 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 we have my company. We have over a hundred thousand people in a variety of groups, and I do have the which fear ones. That face- so trend. I mean, trends. You know, we're get. We have many, many, many thousands of subscribers, and they're all there. And consistently, people say that it's the best part of the subs- their paid subscription. And people laughed at us when we use Facebook groups, but it has the high, I- I've been doing building communities for 10 years. If you create a community forum now, you're going to get a thousand people and maybe one person will post. On Facebook, it's closer to five or 10% of people will actually post. The The rate of engagement per thousand people is significantly higher than any other platform I've ever seen. Now, the problem that people consistently complain about is, Oh, but I got to use Facebook. Mm. So, but it, the gr- Facebook groups is the hottest thing going right now. And you could tell because they advertise for it in BART. And, and out, anytime a company like Facebook buys outdoor advertising for a product, you know, that's the thing they're going to be pimping out hard. Um, and that's what they are. But micro communities, I agree with you. That sentiment is there, but no other platform comes close at the moment. Yeah, it'd be great if somebody could figure out how to do micro platforms on a macro platform, which I guess is what Facebook's goal is there right like zuck said we have to have these smaller groups so that people are not just you know getting the trending trendiest stories but you know smaller groups might result in a better experience you know what was an- interesting though was meetup.com when meetup.com yeah. was for sale i looked at the the numbers i i got their deck and it was intriguing i think that ultimately facebook's going to crush them but i think that they had a legit shot at trying that yeah i'm good friends with scott heiferman and he started that company i think 15 years ago um and I don't know what it eventually sold for. What do you think it went for? 20 million, 30 million when it sold to? Yeah, about one times revenue. Wow. Maybe two times revenue. 
Dude, they lost $25 million the year after WeWork bought them. You know, I was going to look at it as well. I think Kevin Ryan is a friend of ours, a uh, friend of the pod and um, really smart cat. He, uh, I've known him since the Silicon Alley days. He, he was the one who bought it. Um, and it, it seems like a, a smart buy. Speaking of smart buys, AMC, uh, the movie theater chain, which obviously is uh, at zero in terms of reven re revenue and close to bankruptcy, according to reports, uh, is dancing with... Amazon, which is considering a bid uh, for the chain, according to an article in Fortune. Uh, what do you guys think? Hot or not? Dope or nope? It sounds like something the investment bankers put out there to try to get other bidders. Ah, trying to pump the price. Now, wait, Sam, you, so are you, you think it's dope or nope? Just on a- Awesome. Sam, you love it. Why? Unpack. Um. I mean, going. It, this is so simple and obvious. I mean, it would just be exciting to go to the movie theater and see Amazon films out, which I think you can already. But just to have a more direct relationship with with the audience, I think it's wonderful. And they can make it part of Amazon Prime that your tickets are. You get two tickets a month with Amazon Prime or one ticket, or you can get a and subscription. And you can buy more stuff there. I mean, this is a home run. How on earth does this not sound interesting? I don't know if it's actually going to happen. I bet it could be totally a rumor. I, if I worked at AMC, I would make up that rumor too in order to find a buyer. But that would be amazing. This is a big, bold swing. I love Amazon at Whole Foods. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Zach? I mean, like, so now that they, they broke the embargo on first release films into people's homes, mm -hmm. and you think about the quality of home theater we all have now, huge TV, good sound systems, that's that horse is out of the barn. Because the, the movie, you know, the production companies make so much more money if they cut out basically the distribution through the movie theater. And a whole bunch of people are going to be like, why would I go to the movie theater when I can do this in my own home? And so I think you're going to see a material, you know, 20 plus percent of the revenue that used to go into the movie theaters is going to move into direct home screening and for, for just release pictures. And when you do that, we've overbuilt the movie theater infrastructure that we have out there. We're going to have to deleverage that whole thing. It's going to be a disaster for the I have to say, years. one of the things I miss most about being in quarantine is taking my daughter to the movies. Me too. I think you're on drugs, Zach. I still, I still think you're wrong. I think yeah, it's going to go. Too. It, a uh, lot of people do think I'm on drugs and that I'm wrong all the time. So like, wait, are you, are you on so drugs wrong. during this podcast taping? <laughs> How many gummies did you have? <laughs> you are so off. The going to the movie theaters uh, is wonderful. So many people. Want to bet? I'll bet no. you. I'll bet you a thousand dollars. Oh, here we go. See, Sushi that bet. we see in the next. Uh, let's call it. Well, you need like call it three years. We see sequential year over year declines in movie theater. Oh, that's already existed in terms of people going. Yeah, but, I think we're going to see like yeah. that's my argument, which yeah. is that like because now that the horse is out of the barn in terms of like direct to home new release movies, some percentage of the population is going to stop going to movies. I agree with you that going to movies is great, but when I'm not going to go to the movie as much, there's such I can a watch a brand new movie on my home theater. Why no, would I do that? no, because, because not everyone's it's... rich. Like, I mean, we're look at us, we're ballers. Like, not everyone has this fancy TV. And oh yeah, they do, dude. You can buy like I, my cut, my fifty. No, no. But it's also about the experience of seeing a film on that giant screen with a group of people yeah. collectively. That's fun for people who like other humans, Zach. Yeah, but but we're not talking about. We're, we're not talking about the core of the value of the experience because I agree with you guys. The core of the value of experience is good. It's amazing to go to the movie theaters. But we're talking about is incremental growth or decline. Oh. And my argument is, is that yeah, yeah, because I, the movie production companies have a financial incentive to sell it to you directly and cut out the middleman, and now they've done that, they're never going to go back. And now that that's happening, then you're going to see a percentage of the population just not wanting to go to the movie theater. All right, what's your best idea? Everybody think about it for a second. Amazon now owns Amazon owns AMC. What's your best single idea on, for to iterate on the product? A bold iteration on the product. Now, for obviously for when they bought Whole Foods, you know, they're going to do that uh, checkout kind of thing. The grab and go will eventually come to Whole Foods and obviously they're delivering it as part of Prime uh, and getting that delivery. What is your big idea? When you're ready, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Sam, are you ready? Zach, do you have a great idea? I'm ready, I'm ready. Go ahead, Zach. What's your great idea for Bezos if you're the product manager, you're the GM of Amazon's new theater chain? I mean, obviously you need to do dynamic pricing because you've got dynamic pricing. real estate that you've paid for. You've got 
you know, all those empty seats, large amount of the day, dynamically price that and make it available to prime members where you can basically for a dollar, go see a movie at a certain off hour and just fill those seats. And then advertise on the front of the movies with all of your different Amazon products and done. Sam, your best idea for... Okay, Zach, I'll let you have the fancy pants answer. I'm more of a simpleton. Two words. <laughs> Flavored popcorn, baby. The margins on popcorn are massive. <laughs> just You just gotta have Parmesan, caramel, uh, some, uh, five other varieties. You're just gonna garlic. go hard. You're gonna lean into the popcorn. Uh, yeah, you make, all, you make all your money on a bag of popcorn. If I can sell right. 10% more popcorn with flavored salts... I'm winning. All right, guys. These they are, they these already are, have that? They, not, no, no. Not they have the theaters. little salt for $2 at the end. What Sam's talking about is next level. He's talking about you put it in a in a bowl, you mix it in, and then you right. give yourself that fresh caramelized or yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever they call that corn. Um, what's the corn you get at the farmer's market? Kettle. Kettle corn, right, with a little yeah. sugar on it, whatever Flavored it is. popcorn, baby. Two words. Flavored popcorn. Me, Jeff. All right. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna love this one. It's gonna be in your the next uh, issue of Trends. <laughs> Here's my big idea: Amazon Prime subs- unlimited subscription for the movie theaters. The movie theaters are open uh, and have many more showings than they currently. And you use your Amazon card or your smartphone to book a ticket. You scan yourself in. You don't need to have a staff there. And you go take your seat and you can see an unlimited amount of movies for X dollar amount, like MoviePass was. But you just take that Amazon Prime group, and if you just add $100, you get unlimited movies every year. Boom. And you take the entire catalog of other movies and other TV shows, and you say, you know what? We have this new hit coming out, uh, Man in the High Castle. Season three of Man in the High Castle will debut for two weeks, and you can go see it in our theaters anytime episode and you can just check your phone and you'll see when episode one, two, three, and four, and you can stay in the theater. If you want to stay in the same seat and watch them back to back, you can stay and go at 12 o'clock till midnight and watch all 12 episodes. How dope would that be? Dope or nope, Sam? I'm not sitting in a movie theater for more than three hours. Wow. I'm, you, uh, what do you think for kids, teenagers, whatever, and the families, the ability to have like an Amazon Look, I Prime think it's unlimited? Amazing. I think it's amazing. I think all three things that we said is amazing. I think that this is all just- right. Put us in Amazon- the game, Jeff. A- Amazon owning AMC is awesome. I love AMC. Yeah. Do you think I, this, is this actually going to happen? Who knows? No. Are you? Do you have the AMC? Um, oh no, I have. Uh, yeah, I have AMC Movie Club. Do you have that? Where yeah, you get I go one to movie theaters three times a month, maybe. Yeah, me too. And so I get one free ticket every month, and then they keep them on account, and then you don't have to pay like the three or four dollars in fees, and you get twenty percent off at the concession. It's the greatest deal ever. Yeah, I uh, love it's, it. It's like their version of Movie Pass, which failed. I go to the theater all the time, and it's 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 packed always. Yeah, I think with this, the number of movie theaters has gone down as they shutter, these ones come out. I always thought that HBO should buy one of these theaters or Netflix, and then if uh, Game of Thrones comes out on Sunday night, you could have on Thursday, Friday, Saturday Game of Thrones in the theater. So if you're really jonesing. Go see Game of Thrones Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and put 20 extra minutes in it or a behind-the-scenes thing. Can you imagine how great that would have been? How packed would the theaters have been on Thursday, Friday, Saturday with a Game of Thrones with an extra 10-minute or a mini-episode at the end? It would be bonkers. How come these guys aren't thinking? You guys got to think a little more creatively. All right. What? You're saying flavored popcorn isn't interesting as as dynamic pricing or a Thursday night Game of Thrones? I have had to rank the three ideas. Hmm. I like name. flavored popcorn. I think that's Look, yeah, flavored popcorn. I mean, that's, obviously, that's... flavored popcorn is number one. So I'm just thinking <laughs> yeah, who's on. number two. Made a power move. <laughs> it's like buying a software company, just tripling the price of the monthly the monthly subscription. Like this is just an easy win. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks again for tuning into this week in startups. Go ahead and follow our guests, the Sam Parr with two R's, T H E S A M P P A R R, founder of the Hustle. Uh, unlikable, intelligent, charismatic, and a uh, cool cat in my book. I don't care what any of the haters are saying on Twitter. Zach Colius uh, is Zach Colius, C-O-E-L-I-U-S. If you're uh, a startup, man, that's one of the people you want to get on your cap table early. Save him a slice. Average check size for you these days, Zach, what's the range? 500 to a million. 500 to a million, which means you're doing seed stage to Series A, correct? Yes. Pre-product market fit 
do you make investments pre launch? If I know the people or I know the space. Got it. So nobody's talking you in to investing in their company if you didn't know them previously and you knew the space previously. But if you knew them before, you might make a better offer. Well, I invest in lots of people I didn't know before, but after they've got the product working and there's data. Yeah. What do you think? Are you seeing more deals now or less deals now in, in quarantine? Oh, down 90%. Deal flow went through the floor. Like I used to get, I mean, so many emails every day about new deals and it's a trickle now. It's it started to heat up over the last week or so, but, and I've got two deals. I just, I just syndicated one deal. It's going out on my angel syndicate today. Um, and then I've got another one I did that Kraft is doing actually oh. um, that I'm co-investing with. Um, oh, yum, yum. Um, that's a good one. But otherwise, man. Zach, DMs good. are open. Zach, DMs are open. Uh, let me ask you a question about this. Somebody emailed me. I've been getting this email a lot. AngelList now is funneling people to funds as opposed to individual syndicates. Can you still invest in individual syndicates on AngelList? If you're a new angel, or do you have to join a fund now? As an so accredited? what that's always been there, and so okay. what they've done to sort of deal with the sophisticated investor problem is, if you're a new investor joining AngelList, they'll route you to the funds before they'll let you basically participate in the syndicates. Why? But I have two thousand people in my yeah. syndicate, so it's it's. it's Why would they do there. it that way? Why would they do it that way? And what's their thinking? I don't think it makes any sense. I've always just said, look, make it so they can only invest a little bit of money in syndicates and let them learn. So right. expose them to deal by deal decision making, small amounts of money. Then that's how you build up a track record and you learn to become yes. a sophisticated investor. I mean, I find this whole sophisticated investor like is rule is just complete hogwash. Like, I mean, we sell them lottery tickets, which are negative EV. Like you can happily go buy a negative EV lottery ticket on the street and we'll steal your money. But if you want to go invest in a startup, no, nah, you can't do that. Only the well, I mean, let's be clear about the difference. That's the government giving you that negative EV deal, <laughs> not a startup company. But it does have to change. And the SEC says they're going to change it into AngelList credit. Mm -hmm. They are working with the SEC among most of the platforms. And I'm hoping, I mean, part of the reason I wrote the book and I do Angel University was hoping to train people to learn how to pick companies and get defended by that. You, did you see the uh, tweet storm about Giphy early stage investors were on some platform that no longer exists? And no. so anyway- Which platform? God, it'll come to me in a moment, but it's a platform that no longer exists. It got rebranded, but it was like an angelist contemporary, you know, whatever, 10 years ago. Anyway, somebody who's a high profile person who works at Slack, this guy, Matt, who I've met before, uh, nice guy. Uh, he put 2500 in and he hasn't heard from the company in like five years, which is not uncommon for, you know, some of these uh, platforms where they tell the people don't contact the founders or the founders don't give updates. One of the things I've tried to work against because it's kind of a bummer, uh, but they might have been wiped out because of the preference stack is basically and they're basically like, oh, angel investing is a fraud. And it's like, no, that company got high, overvalued and there was more invested in it. But um Interesting uh, discussion to have. Okay, we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.